As our kids uh, run off to the hut, just uh, want to remind you of a couple things to uh, be aware of as we approach February. Uh, the main one being our uh, our restarting of uh, of our Sunday school, and so uh, pay attention to uh, what's happening there. Uh, the kids will meet over in the hut again, and uh, as adults, we'll meet here, and uh, we'll be going through our. Uh, abridged doctrinal statements. So um, if you want to kind of know what we believe and why, that would be a good place for you to start. Uh, I think that's what, February 4th, something like that. Uh, again, big thank you to everybody who uh, came out last night to our uh, event there at Timber Trails. A little windy, a little cold, but we survived. Thank you to everybody who helped, brought soup and uh, cookies and all the rest. Uh, it was a good time had by all, and I don't think we lost anybody. At least I'm unaware of it. And if we did lo lose them, and we don't know about it, eh, probably weren't that important anyway. So, all right, turn to the Book of Hebrews once again. I want to start in chapter five, eleven, again to uh, to set our context so that we kind of understand where our author has come from. And uh, where he's gone here, uh, the entire section of our author is uh, 11 to 620, so that's kind of one continued sort of thought. Uh, we're in 9 to 12 today, and then 13 to 20 next week. So let's read 11 to 12, just so we can set our feet in what's going on here. About this we have much to say, and it's hard to explain since you become dull of hearing. For though by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not solid food. For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, since he is a child. But solid food is for the mature, for those who have the powers of discernment, trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. Therefore, let us leave the elementary doctrine of Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, and of instruction about washings, the laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead, and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For it is impossible in the case of those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, and have shared in the Holy Spirit, and have tasted the goodness of the word of God, and the powers of the age to come, and then have fallen away, to restore them again to repentance, since they are crucifying once again the Son of God to their own harm and holding him up to contempt. For land that has drunk the rain that often falls on it and produces a crop useful to those for whose sake it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it bears thorns and thistles, it is worthless and near to being cursed, and its end is to be burned." Though we speak in this way, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. And we desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have the full assurance of hope until the end, so that you may not be sluggish, but imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises." Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we uh, once again desire to understand your word, un understand it, uh, to live it, to be changed by it, we ask that you send your Holy Spirit among us to use can be changed according to that your name would be glorified and Lord that Now? What now? There we go. All right. 
There's nothing, uh, or few things anyway, that cripples Christian joy, Christian zeal, quite like fear and anxiety and uncertainty relating to your relationship to God. When you get up each day wondering whether or not God really loves you, whether he's for you, he's on your side, it's hard to find the passion to serve God and to live victoriously. It's, it's hard to find the strength to resist temptation and to live wholeheartedly for Jesus. We is, is filled with doubts about whether or not God even likes you. When your heart is riddled with fear that, that you might not be doing enough to please God and, and wonder whether, if, whether or not he will continue to put up with you because you realize how much sin you commit and he obviously knows all of the stuff that lies behind it. So how can God actually be on your side when you are so riddled with sinfulness? All right, we're going to do this. Is that good? Okay. It's difficult when you obsess over whether or not the promises you read about in Scripture are really yours. It's hard when you read about these beautiful things that God says he's going to do for you and then to doubt whether they will actually come to fruition. Again, because you know who you really are. And when you find yourself in these moments of doubt and anxiety and struggle and fear, the Christian life becomes burdensome. It becomes unappealing. It becomes difficult. But when your heart is filled with rock-solid assurance, when your heart is encouraged by the knowledge that your hope in Jesus Christ will not disappoint and that your relationship with God is unshakably certain, well, that changes things. There's no limit then to the joy that you feel and the satisfaction that you feel in your spiritual life. Yes, there'll be up and downs, but you know with surety that you are a son or daughter of God. See, what our author is trying to do in verses 9 to 12 is to prevent his true believers in this church from fear, anxiety, and doubt. I think we could all agree that verses 4 to 8 are some of the most aggressive, in-your-face verses in all of Scripture. And given the aggressiveness of his words and the intention of what he says in verses 4 to 8, the tone that verses 9 to 12 come at us with should grab our attention. In the previous verses, 4 to 8, we have a, a very sobering assessment of a certain kind of people who have tasted and seen and participated in and learned much of Christianity, but have, after all of that, decided they wanted none of it, revealing themselves to never actually have been saved in the first place, and they walk away. They choose to remove themselves from the community of God's people. The aim of verses 4 to 8 was to cause fear, to cause trepidation in the hearts of those to whom it applied. It was not, of course, to cause those who are truly saved to be fearful that they aren't actually saved. Its aim was to cause those who are not truly saved, but, but think they are, and have the thorns and thistles to prove it, it's to shock them into repentance. Our author knows that there are a lot of people who are not truly and eternally saved, who lived under the false of belief that they are, and he wants their attention. He wants them to understand what is at stake. And so he directs his words towards them with all the fury and warning that he can muster. But the author of Hebrews also knows that there are a lot of people, the vast majority of people in this congregation, who are saved. 
that may question, because of what he has just written, that they are indeed saved. The author knows that the sort of language he's used and the warning that he's issued about false believers might create undue anxiety in the hearts of those who confidently know Christ. And he doesn't want this warning to undermine the assurance of salvation, which should be the possession of everybody who truly knows Christ. He doesn't want his tough but necessary language for one group of people to, d- to undermine those who are of a completely different group. Verses 9 to 12 are written to those who are truly saved who should live out of a firm assurance of their salvation. He doesn't want these harsh words of verses 4 to 8 to undermine their confident hope, their assurance of salvation. And so he says in verse 9, though we speak in this way, referring back to verses 4 to 8, though we speak like that, yet in your case, beloved, we feel sure of better things, things that belong to salvation. Now, this group that he's talking to, let's remember, he's had harsh words for them as well. This group is immature. It demonstrates an infant-like faith verses, uh, f- from chapter 5, 11 to verses 6, 3. Yet even still, he is confident that of what he sees in these people. He's confident of the fruit that he sees in their lives and that that fruit demonstrates that they are indeed saved. The author is hopeful for them. He believes that the warnings will not drive them away in resentment and anxiety and fear and doubt, but will instead deepen their vigilance to persevere, deepen their pursuit of assurance and hope and faith. Now these verses are, are the first of two avenues which our author desires to set in his readers regarding the assurance of salvation, regarding perseverance of faith. This first section focuses on the nature of their salvation, what he sees in their lives, and the second section, which is verses 13 to 20, is going to focus on the surety of God's promise and therefore God's hold on them. So we deal with 9 to 12 today. And what our author says very simply is he sees better things, better things. He feels sure of it. He's writing to this group of people and he says, listen, I know that there are some out there who fit the description of verses four to eight, who have a field that God's grace has rained down upon, but yet after however long, all you see is thorns and thistles. You see sin, you see a rejection of God, but I feel sure of the better things, the things that belong to salvation. He doesn't want his readers to question the validity of their faith. A little bit of self-examination is good, but he doesn't want them to question whether or not they're saved. He wants them simply to examine the faith that they have. And he doesn't want that examination to turn into a, a lack of confidence in their faith. He knows they possess saving faith. He tells them explicitly, I know your fruit, and that their life of faith and repentance and obedience has demonstrated to him what kind of field they have. As if to reinforce his confidence in them, he refers to them as beloved. The only place in the letter where this term appears. And I think it's Uh, it's very significant that it's in this context that he reminds his readers that they are indeed beloved. And I I don't want to make too much of it, but I do want to focus in on this word because it is unique to the book and it is in a significant place. Again, let's remember the context that we're in because the word stands out even more when you read over the previous verses from which we have just come. The author has said, as I mentioned, some of the most pointed and harshest words, not only within the book of Hebrews, but within all of the New Testament. 
Setting aside verses 4 to 8, which don't apply to these people, our author has already said that, what he has said about them immediately before is some pretty serious smack talk. We mentioned a couple of weeks ago that our author is intentionally trying to rile them up. He is purposefully insulting them to try and get them to realize how concerned he is about their lack of maturity in the faith. He has said that they are dull of hearing, that by this time in their spiritual maturity, they should be teaching others. But he says, actually, you cannot teach others because you don't even know the ABCs of Christian life in order to read those things that you should learn. You need to go back and learn the ABCs before you can actually learn the elementary truths. And then he says, actually... If that isn't insulting enough, let me say it this way. You're an infant. You've chosen to be a baby and to, and to be stuck on milk, even though you should be meat eaters right now. These are not exactly complimentary words. This isn't exactly the kind of ego-boosting, positive language kind of stuff that we're used to. And it is certainly not the kind of stuff that you would expect from a pastor, and yet he's concerned for his people. And after all of that, after all of that telling them where they stand from his perspective and what the results are going to be, he says, I want you to know this. You are still my beloved. I still love you. That's what that word means. You're my, you're my loved one. You're the ones whom I love. And I think this word is placed here at absolutely the perfect time. He wants them to know that even in the ferocity of his teaching, even when he pulls no punches in what he's about to say, even after battering them with some very negative observations regarding their current spiritual state, he assures them with one word of why he spoke to them this way. I said all those things because I love you. I love you. Now, I think it's safe to say that we are part of a culture that would not take too kindly to the words spoken in the previous context. I can just imagine this, this pastor saying these words and immediately members of his congregation posting little clips to TikTok about what he said and all the negative responses that he would get. And if his board wasn't very strong, he'd be out the next week. How dare you talk to us like this? We're part of a culture of, of victims and whiners and sulkers. Trigger warnings are everywhere. If someone says something negative about us, no matter how they say it, no matter what place they say it from, or how constructive it might be, if it is critical, if it's negative, our society encourages us to be offended by it. It encourages us to, to slump into a cocoon of, of self-protective, self-justifying woundedness. We are very easily hurt and easily provoked to offense. Yet for a Christian, those things are not an option. For a Christian, it's not good because it ruins the opportunity to grow in the grace and the knowledge of Jesus Christ. As believers, it should be in our nature to want to grow, to change, to develop, to shed and to put on, to borrow Paul's imagery. Take off certain things and put on certain other things. To, to take to heart the firm warnings that we read in scriptures, not just the, the encouraging stuff, not just the uplifting stuff, not just the soar on the wings of eagles stuff, but the stuff that's actually down in the dirty business of, re, of, of getting rid of sin in our lives. As Christians, we should welcome that. There's no place for being a victim in the Christian life. Sanctification is all about taking the spiritual criticism as well as the positive biblical teaching, putting them together and growing. Now remember, our sanctification is not about 
becoming what we aren't. Our sanctification is about growing into who we already are. Be who you are. That is a non-technical, non-theological definition of sanctification. Be who you are. It's about living out the fullness of grace that God has provided for us on account of our union with Christ. And when we remember that, remember who we are in Christ, then any kind of observation like our author gives us here should be welcomed. When we remember that we are chosen by God, that we are loved by God, forgiven by God, accepted by God, indwelt by God, guided by God, protected by God, strengthened by God. And when God is more important to us than anyone else in the world, then we would want to be like him more than anything else in the world. And so we would invite this kind of language. We don't have to feel triggered. We don't have to feel insecure or self-justifying or self-defensive or self-pitying when someone loves us enough to disciple us loves us enough to correct us, loves us enough to to teach us in ways in which we are immature because we should desire above all things to become more and more like our Savior. See, our author loves these people, so he smacks them around a little bit because it's good for them. Because he knows that they possess the things that belong to salvation, one of which should be the desire to be more like their Savior. So he says, I I know that there are better things for you, even though I spoke the way I did about you. I love you enough to say those things. And now he says, I want to, to give you some salve for your wound. I've wounded you. I've told you where I think you stand in the maturity scale, but I don't want you to doubt your salvation. I want you to be assured of your salvation. I want that assurance to ground you so that you can live a perseverant life, correct these things, and move forward. So then he says in verse 10, this is what I see. This is why I can say that there are better things, things associated with salvation. This is why I'm confident that what I said to you before will be accepted, taken in, and you will live a a, a better life as a result of it. And he says, verse 10. How does the author know that this group is truly saved? Where does his confidence lie? How can he be so sure? He says, verse 10, I see two things in your life. He says, I look at your fruit. Remember the illustration we just had. I look at your fruit and what I see, or I look at your, the land that it, that it is your life, and I look at the fruit that's growing there, and when I see that, what I see are two very specific things, two things that have to be associated with salvation, and, and those are things that give me confidence. Now, again, let's, let's remember that these two things are not things that resulted in their salvation. It's not that these things come first, and then he says, oh, I see those things therefore you are saved. He says, I see two things that can only flow from a truly saved person. That's that's the fruit that I see. The first of which is their love for God's name. The second of which is their love for God's name working itself out in their willingness to serve the saints. I see that you love God's name and I see that you're willing to serve the saints. And these are are both positive fruits which arise from a field that has been properly cultivated. So the first thing that he sees is God is supreme and central in their spiritual affections, if I can borrow from Jonathan Edwards' language. They love God's name. What does that mean exactly? Exactly. Well, it means that their first and foundational passion is to see God glorified. To love God's name is to love when he is affirmed and he is extolled and his honor and beauty is seen by all above all. See, to love God's name is to rejoice when all the attention all the credit turns to him. 
when everything turns towards him, everything good and righteous, everything that is positive goes directly to the elevation of his honor and his name. This is, this is our author's way of saying that these people are engrossed by God. They're consumed by God. They're determined that God be preeminent in all things, no exceptions allowed. And the outworking of that, the evidence of that, is seen in their work that they have done in serving the saints. Now we're going to see this brought up again after another difficult passage that our author is going to, going to or within our, which our author is going to speak very negatively about this congregation in chapter 10. And in that context, our author is going to point back to the beginning of their salvation in Christ, back to the very beginning of their life in the church, when they stood tall in the face of opposition. They were publicly insulted, they were persecuted a little bit, and their property was taken away. But even more heroic in his life, or in their life, is how unselfishly that they committed themselves to helping those around them who were suffering in a greater way than they were. So if you go to chapter 10, verses 33 and 34, he says that they were sometimes publicly expo exposed to reproach and affliction, and that they were then partners with those so treated. For you had compassion on those who were in prison. In other words, their Christian lifestyle was one of daring courage, daring compassion, and giving themselves to serving other people regardless of the cost to themselves, regardless of the potential trouble in doing so. And so in these verses, our author is recognizing that that kind of thing started in the church and continues in its present life. It's, it's a present focus that he talks about. The whole of the phrase here reads, in serving the saints as you still do. As you still do. You love God's name, and because you love God's name, you continue to serve the saints. And here's the kicker. It's not just he that sees it. He says God sees it too. He says, God sees it. He, beginning of verse 10, For God is not unjust so as to overlook your work and the love that you have shown for his name in serving the saints as you still do. Here's what he's saying in a nutshell, and then we'll unpack it because I'm a theologian and I love this stuff. He's saying that when you do what God desires of you to do, which is to glorify his name and serve others, God sees it and he'll reward you for it. He is, he is not blind to your service of him in his name. He's telling his audience, in fact, that it would be unjust for God to overlook their devotion to the glory and supremacy of his name and the service offered to his people. Now, it's an interesting appeal when you think about it. And again, we're going to slip into my theologian part of it here, so hopefully you can track me. We usually think of God's justice in terms of judgment, right? I think that's usually how we think of things. That when justice, when the justice of God shows up, he is the, he's the, the judge sitting behind a big desk with a gavel, and he's telling you, go to hell and you are judged and I'm going to strike you down and you get tumors in the groin and leprosy and all the rest, right? But that's not how it's presented here. See, you would expect, actually, for our author saying something like the grace of God. God is gracious or he's merciful. And because of that, he doesn't overlook it. You see, mercy is usually what we associate it with God rescuing us from judgment. That God's judgment comes as a negative thing, a, a really a angry, wrathful thing. And God's mercy is what stays that wrath, stays that judgment. But here, we're told that God's justice is the lens through which he sees our love for his name and our love for his service. So, so what 
what does that mean? Well, it's actually quite encouraging for us to know that God is looking at us through his justice as well as through his mercy and grace. You see, the justice of God or the righteousness of God is, is not simply giving people what they deserve. Okay, that's usually what we think of when we think of righteousness, is God always gives people what they deserve. Well, that's true, and then we usually take it to the fact that we're all sinners and we all deserve judgment, and then grace comes and then some are saved, right? And that's right, that's good. But what we need to recognize is what I've just described is, is not God's justice and righteousness per se, it's the result of God's righteousness when it comes up against sin. But what happens when God's justice comes across righteousness? What happens when his righteousness sees righteousness? Well, then his justice has to respond, but in a different way. You see, God's righteousness fundamentally involves him standing up for himself. God is just and righteous. He is, he is righteous. He is he is himself what is right. And so for him, he is ultimately righteous when he stands for his own glory. When he glorifies his own name, he is being righteous. He is acting justly. So let's flip this. God would be unjust and unrighteous if he ever acted in a way that belittled the greatness of his name. This means that the essence of justice and righteousness is complete devotion to the best and purest and most worthy thing and most right thing in the universe, which is what? The glorification of God. Or to use this language in the language of Old Testament, the glorification of God's name. That is what God does in his righteousness. He pursues and protects himself and his name. Which means that the greatest injustice in the universe is to neglect and dishonor the name and the glory of God. So God himself, the best and purest and most glorious and most worthy and most righteous being in all the world, must pursue himself. Have I lost you? Here's how it applies here. So if God is himself going to be righteous, he must of necessity, inherently, be committed above all else to the glory and the praise of his name. For God not to love and honor his own name above all else would be for him to commit idolatry. God must love God preeminently. How's that for a theological statement? God must love God preeminently. It is only just and right that he does so because he is God. And that's why it is important for us to recognize that his justice or his righteousness takes note of those who love his name. And in his justice and righteousness, he says, that is exactly what you should be doing because that's what I'm doing. I pursue my name above all things. That is, the, the, that is who I am. And when you do that, you are acting righteously. And in my justice, I will reward you for doing what you should be doing. You are standing righteously before me. And that is why I'm going to use this word. And I don't want you to take it in a wrong way. But that is why he must bless those who glorify his name. Because for him to do something differently would him be for him to act unjustly. Or we could put it this way. It is the right thing for God to do to bless those who are doing what they should be doing and pursuing his name. Does that make sense? Now our author says negatively. God is not unjust. What he's saying is that God is just. When he looks at you and sees your pursuit of his name and the service of God's people, and if you do it the way he does it, you will be blessed for that. Now, let me just deal with a couple of things. Does this mean that I can merit God's love? 
right? Because that, that, now we're adjacent to works, right? We're adjacent to me saying, well, you know, the old uh, debate between condign and congruent merit that the, uh, oh, whatever, doesn't matter. So does this mean that I can merit God's love, that, that I can do good works and then God just merit, that I say, look, I've bound you to me. Look, I've done something good. You owe me. Well, of course not, right? If we understand the justice and righteousness of God as just outlined, we understand then that when God looks into our ministry to the saints and sees it done for the love of his name, he is unwaveringly committed to his own justice, right? We know that. The justice of God does not repay in a merit sort of way, but it recognizes righteousness done, which is his glorification. And here is where things just get mind-numbing. Because there's a wonderful contrast here with the righteousness of God. There's a wonderful contrast that exists because... God forgets a lot of things about us in his justice, in his righteousness. We're told, Psalm 103, verse 12, as far as the east is from the west, east, east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgression. But on the other hand, God remembers every act of love that we ever do out of love for him. And for the glorification of his name. Think about the implications of that. When God looks at you, all of the sinfulness that is in you, he doesn't see. Why? Because Christ is standing there saying, I, I took that. You cannot put that on him because you put that on me. And it is now east from west. So he doesn't see your sin. But what he does see in his justice is all of the good things that you do in pursuit of his name. Now, if that doesn't give you assurance, if that doesn't get you fired up, get you a little tingly inside, I don't know what does. See, when God looks at you, all he sees is the righteous things that you have done, which he has enabled you to do because of his mercy and his grace. All the other stuff is east from west. It's been taken by Jesus. I don't know of any greater incentive for us to turn our hearts away from the world and to give them to Jesus Christ and to live out of that insurance than that. But it does raise another question. How do I know if I'm serving for self or serving from God? That, that's always a, a bit of a, a difficult one for us. And let me just say it this way. God only knows and you can't fool him. So you'll find out in the end. But let me, let me offer some additional clarification, some, some clarification that we do get from Scripture, a, a way in which you can sort of evaluate the way in which you're acting. And it's simply to go to what Jesus said in Matthew 27, when he was asked, what's the greatest commandment? He says, well, the greatest commandment is to love your Lord your God with all your heart and your soul and your mind and your strength. Glorify his name, pursue his name above all things. And he says, oh, by the way, the second commandment is like it. The second commandment flows from it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. So we must love God's name and help God's people. We must love God's glory and serve God's saints. But we must get the order right. You've got to get the order right. Service for others must come out of the abundant overflow of your love for God's glory. Why do you serve? Because you love God. This is a difficult, this is a difficult one. See, merely humanitarian service is not Christian. It's actually idolatrous. If, please understand what I'm saying and what I'm not saying. If you serve somebody for their sake, that's idolatrous. You shouldn't be serving them for their sake. You should be serving them for God's sake, because you pursue God's name and then you serve others out of that. You want to see God glorified, so you manifest that in service. You start out with a foundation of love for God and satisfaction in God and commitment to God and love for God above all things, and then that works itself out in serving his people. 
And our author says, if that is what you do, God's justice will see it, he'll remember it, and he'll reward it. Now again, let's not lose the author's overall point. He wants his readers, he wants us, to have assurance of faith. He wants us to have assurance of our salvation. He doesn't want us to waver in our faith. He doesn't want us to doubt the the surety of what God has done in us and what he is going to do for us. Uh, Put simply, if we have undergone an inner change through Christ that affects us outwardly in our character, producing a lifestyle that causes us to care and love and serve others, then we can have the greatest confidence in our faith. This means, as our author has already said, that your fruit matters. Bearing fruit and what fruit is there is a serious indication of what's going on. So then we have to ask ourselves, what does, what does your fruit say about you? Right? If the author says, I know you're saved because of two things. One, you love God's name above others. How do I know that? Because you self-sacrificially serve others. If that's the standard, what's your fruit? What's your level of service? See, I find it interesting here that, that a lot of the times when we talk about spiritual maturity, see, we are, we are um, independent, self-centered, sort of me, North Americans. And typically when we think about spiritual maturity, we think about what? How much I pray, how much I read my Bible, how much I meditate, how much I, 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 I. And nobody else can really know. So I am, the, I am the temperature gauge of my spiritual maturity in that regard, right? But what our author says is, you, know, you, you want to know how I know you're, you're assured of salvation? Because of what I see you doing in the congregation of God's people. Right? And I think that that's tough. There's, there's an entire sermon in that regard. Right? Because serving other people in God's name is not easy. It's so easy for me to stay at home and do nothing and just be by myself and convince myself that I am actually a good Christian. But in scripture, it's always your relationship to the community of God's people that is the gauge of your maturity. And the author says, how, this is how I know that even though you should be teachers, even though you, you eat or drink milk, not solid food, I am confident in your salvation because I see your salvation in Jesus Christ exerting an influence on your character and you find yourself serving God's people, giving yourself to God's people. Why? Because you love God more than you love yourself. And then you give. So then the question for us is, does your relationship with Jesus Christ exert an influence on your character that is so strong so strong that you find yourself thinking about and living in a way that is less like the individualistic world around you and more like him who came to give his life for many. If you hold on to your life, you're not reflecting your Savior. If you give away your life, that is what it means to be Christ-like. Your fruit reveals your field Your field reveals your destiny. Verses 11 to 12. Now our author says, listen, I I know that there are things that are better, things of salvation for you. And now what I want you to do is I want you to have full assurance of hope. I want you to live out of what I see, live out of that salvation. He says, I see the love for God's name and the service that comes from that foundation. And now I want you to have hope that, that just bursts forth from your assurance of salvation. And his desire in this is to have them to continue to pursue God, as you'll notice the last phrase of verse 12, to continue to be imitators of those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. Now we're going to find out what the promises are in verses 13 to 20. So that's, that's next week. But the first thing our author says is, I want you to continue on in earnestness, To have the full assurance of hope until the end. Now let's make sure that we understand what biblical hope is and what it is not. 
Biblical hope is not wishful thinking. Okay? It's not a, a, a desire for something to happen that may or may not happen, right? Something like, I don't know, who's your favorite hockey team? Rufo. I hope the Leafs win the Stanley Cup. That will never happen. Sorry, Rufo. 1967, man, history's not on your side. Right? That's, that's typically when we say, oh, I hope that we can da 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 I hope that this happens. And it usually comes along, uh, comes with a lot of, you know, I'm 40% thinking it might and 60% knowing it won't, right? It's that kind of stuff. It's not merely the desire for something I want to happen that I know deep down inside will probably not happen to actually come to pass. Biblical hope instead is the confident expectation, notice this, that, ha- that what we have been promised in the past will come to pass undoubtedly in the future. There is a, a spiritual and moral certainty that, in, that is biblical hope. Because what we expect to see and experience and enjoy in the future is something that God himself has promised that he himself will bring to pass. So there's a a spiritual and a moral certainty that is encapsulated in, in biblical hope. God himself has said that he will do it. And so we are hopeful, not in a wishful sense, but in a we're guaranteed it's going to happen sense. Hope then becomes a solid foundation. It becomes a solid rock. It becomes unshakable because it is rooted in God's faithfulness. God cannot do other than what he has said he will do. So to have hope then is to understand God's promises and to base our lives upon those promises. God has said that something will come to pass and so we hope in those promises. In other words, Christian hope, biblical hope, is a sure thing. It's a sure thing. So we could kind of say it like this. Hope is a subset of faith or it's related to faith very intimately. So think about it this way. This might help. Faith is typically backwards looking, right? Faith looks in the past or it looks at the present and says, I I believe what God has already done, what God has already said, and I stand upon that belief. What hope does is it actually looks to the future and says, based upon what I know about God in the past, Because of faith, I will live out and I will believe and I will trust that God will also fulfill that in the future. Hope, as John Piper says, is faith in the future tense. I like like that. Hope is faith in the future tense. It says, I know that what God has said is firm and solid and what what he says is true. And I am going to base my future on that. So our author wants us to be earnest. He wants us to be zealous in our pursuit of this hope. The assurance of faith that comes with this kind of hope doesn't show up automatically. It comes through work and striving and commitment and diligence. Notice what he says. We desire each one of you to show the same earnestness to have full assurance. In other words, full assurance of hope until the end doesn't just show up. It's something that has to be has be worked for. There, there's, there's desire put into motion that has to come out of this. Our author doesn't say exactly how, how this shows up, but I think there's a couple of things, a couple of ways in which we can strive based upon where we are in the book. So when he says, Earn, I want you to desire and show the same earnestness, what is he talking about? I think he's saying two things. First, is there's a necessity to reflect upon and understand the profound truths already set forth about Jesus in this letter. To think about where we've come in understanding Jesus as being supreme over all things, Jesus being better. To reflect upon his his sinless life and what that means for us as we face all the temptations that we face. 
to think about his atoning death in our place, to think about his role as our great high priest, to go all the way back into chapter 1 and to think about who he is as the divine son of God. And then second thing, it comes from being diligent by God's grace to believe his promises and trust his word and to work and serve the saints. Again, we've noticed this throughout Hebrews as, as well, like the images for the Christian faith are always, always looking further down the future. They're always difficult images, right? The military man, the, the boxer, the marathon runner, right? It's this kind of thing that we need to in, be engaged in. Our, our assurance is grounded in the objective teaching of who Jesus is. It's, it's, it's grounded into who Jesus has been revealed to be, but we can receive insurance in full measure as our lives are committed to earnestly having that full assurance of hope. Now the flip side of this assurance of hope, let's not miss this, we've already seen this and its result, and it's said here in verse 12. Uh, he said, the author says, I want you to be earnest to do this so that you won't be sluggish. Now, sluggish is the word that, that sort of is a parenthesis to the, to the first one in verse 11. It tells us that we're kind of at the end of one section here. The great enemy of perseverance of faith and assurance of salvation and of hope for the future is to be sluggish, to be lazy in our faith. Again, the word sluggish, verse 11, was lazy in the ears, sluggish in the ears. More often than not, sluggish ears go with a slack and lazy life. Somebody who's lazy at hearing is also going to be the opposite of earnest in their pursuit of the assurance of our hope. And our author says to us, listen, spiritual sluggishness is a danger that looms over all of us, and it must be worked against. So being fully assured that God is for you and that you belong to him is what will make you earnest, what will make you diligent. It will, it will prevent sluggishness and spiritual laziness. The joy that comes from the full assurance of hope that God has given me everything I need for life and godliness in this life and has destined me for an eternity with him are going to guard me from becoming arrogant and slothful. Again, we live in the light of who we are. And then we receive our, our assurance of faith that God is our God and his promises can be trusted. And that sustains our faith. It, it makes us patient. It makes us wait in hope for the promises of God to come to pass. We must not miss the connection between being fully assured of the solidity and certainty of our hope and you're determined not to be sluggish or slothful. If you know that God's promises are sure in your life, how can you be anything but earnest to see those promises come to fruition? And our author says, listen, it's, it's seen as you look at those who have, that have received God's promises and who have lived the life that you should live. So be imitators of those people who have had what I'm asking you to have. They've been earnest. They've had full assurance of hope until the end. And he's going to use Abraham as an example next week. But for now, he wants us to have the, the earnestness of our faith driving us towards hope. Let's bring this all to a conclusion. Now, as Reformed people... We know that our salvation is safe and secure because of God's great power and because of his covenantal commitment to his words. Right, we, we're familiar with texts like what was read for us this morning from 1 Peter 1, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to the living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading, kept in heaven for you, who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation 
ready to be revealed in the last time. We're encouraged by that. We're encouraged by the fact that though our faith wavers, God's commitment to his covenantal promises never waver. We're familiar with passages like Philippians 1 verse 6, which we've quoted several times. We know that he who has begun a good work in us is bringing it to completion at the day of Christ. And as Christians, we should revel in these truths. We should praise God for them. And we don't want to diminish them in any way. The surety of our faith is something that we need to celebrate. But I fear that it is possible that because of that surety of our salvation spoken of throughout Scripture, that we will then be prone to tune out biblical texts like this one. It's possible for us to to dial down the volume of God's word when the subject of our, of our earnestness and our working in faith come up. Right? And we frame it in, in theological language like, well, you know, that sounds a lot like work salvation to me. And we don't want to go that way, but what we do want to do is recognizing that our Christian faith is lived from a place of surety, but it is still lived in earnestness. Because both the surety of our faith and the command to work out our salvation are both there in Scripture. Let's again listen to Paul from Philippians 2. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, so now, not only is in my presence, but much more in my absence, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. And then he brings the surety of God into it. For it is God who works in you, both to will and to work for his good pleasure. The surety of salvation drives us to earnestness, drives us to obedience. Ephesians 2, 8 to 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not of your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no one may boast. And then verse 10. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Don't ever think that the Christian life does not require effort. Our author has been clear. You will know the status of your heart by the fruit that you exhibit. It is always God-empowered, graced-infused effort but it is effort nonetheless. God is beneath and behind all that we strive to do, but strive we must. We must be earnest in the cultivation of confidence in our hope so that we won't be lazy and negligent when it comes to living lives of faith and patience. We will inherit all that God has promised, not independently from faith, not independently from obedience, but precisely through it and by means of it. And that is one of the primary things that we've seen Jesus doing for us as our great high priest. He stands ever-present and always powerful to sustain within us a heart that treasures God and trusts God. If we desire to grow, to shed sin, and to put on The things of God, Jesus stands in heaven waiting to pour grace upon grace upon grace as much as we need. And when we have these things on our side, our striving becomes God glorifying. Our assurance of hope and perseverance become joyful and earnest. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for these difficult words to understand, these challenging texts of Scripture that remind us of the need for grace-infused, gospel-centered obedience. Lord, I pray that we would all, as your people, find the assurance of hope that is ours in Jesus Christ. I pray that we would find the desire for earnestness I pray that we would be given an increased desire to pursue your name above all things, 
And may that work itself out in service to the body of believers. And may you do all this for the furtherance of your name in our church, for the furtherance of your kingdom, so that you may receive the glory above all things. Amen.